Hello everybody, welcome to my audiobook summary on 0 to 1, Notes on Startups or How to Build the Future by Peter Thiel. This is an audiobook summary that's a combination of some of my own original thoughts and my own thinking as well as some thoughts by ChatGPT written and read in my own voice here. Uh, there are nine chapters in this book and I'm going to go through them basically and summarize them including my own thoughts step by step, chapter by chapter. I'm probably going to make a few mistakes and have some you know, say a few words out of place, but hey, you know what? I'm going to do the best I can, and this is going to be a great summary. So let's just get right into this and start with chapter one. And again, this one is called The Challenge of the Future. In this chapter, Peter lays out the main premise of the book, which is that the most valuable companies of the future will be those that create new things rather than competing in existing markets. He begins by discussing the difference between going from zero to one and going from one to n. Going from 0 to 1 refers to creating something new and valuable, whereas going from 1 to N refers to copying something that already exists and competing in an existing market. Thiel argues that the, le that the latter is less valuable as it leads to cutthroat competition and diminishing returns, whereas the former has the potential to create massive value. If you've read Blue Ocean Strategy, you will no doubt see the similarities between the two books. Um, Theo also goes on to discuss the importance of creating a monopoly in business. That's right, a monopoly. He argues that a monopoly is not necessarily a bad thing, and it can lead to more innovation and better products, which is a contrarian thought if I've ever heard one. But he goes on to explain it quite well, which of course we will get into. He also notes that the most successful companies are monopolies in some form, and that competition is often overrated. Yeah, it's a little different, but hey, so be it. He talks about the way people think about the future, which is often based on linear extrapolation, but the future is not linear. It's non-linear, so it is important to think about the future in a different way, such as considering the possibilities of technological progress, geopolitical shifts, and other major changes. If I interject a little bit here, I think about the recent release of ChatGPT, and then I compare that to technological pro progress, and I get a, you know, wow, it's quite the big jump here. And again, the future may be nonlinear and may be, in fact, built around technology like this. So anyways, just my own thoughts there. Let's keep this get going. Um, in chapter two, it's called, let's see where it is. It's called Party Like It's 1999 by Prince, except it's not by Prince, it's by Peter. Uh, in this one, in this chapter, he basically summarizes and discusses the dot-com bubble of the late 1990s and early 2000s and how it relates to the current state of technology and startups. He goes on and states that the euphoria and optimism that surrounded the dot-com era, with investors pouring mega cash into internet startups, with little regard for fundamentals such as revenue or profits, which is the important point. He also notes that many of these companies were focused on going from 1 to N, rather than going from 0 to 1. And they were more interested in growth and hype rather than creating something truly new and valuable. Thiel then contrasts the dot-com era with the current state of technology and startups and argues that the market has become more skeptical and less enthusiastic about new ideas, which I think is fair. He attributes this change to a number of factors, including the failures of many dot-com companies, the subsequent bear market, and the rise of mobile and social media. He also notes that in the current state of technology, the most valuable companies are those that have created new things rather than simply competing in existing markets. He also notes that new companies are more focused on solving real problems and creating value rather than chasing growth and hype. So it's quite a big difference here. Create something new, create something valuable. In the next chapter, well, let's actually continue on in this one. Um, he basically says that you want to think like a con contrarian, pardon me. He encourages entrepreneurs to be contrarian and to think for themselves rather than just following the crowd. He argues that the best opportunities for creating new things and building valuable companies often come from going against the conventional wisdom. In chapter three, which is titled All, Happening Com All Happy Companies Are Different, he discusses the concept of competitive strategy and how it relates to building a co successful company. He starts by defining competitive strategy as the unique way a company creates value. He argues, again, that the most successful companies are those that have a unique and defensible competitive strategy, which allows them to create a monopoly in their market. That's right, he is pro-monopoly. It's, it's, it's a pretty unique view here. He goes on to discuss the difference between comparative advantage 
an absolute advantage. Comparative advantage refers to the idea that a company should focus on the things it does best, whereas absolute advantage refers to the idea that a company should focus on creating new things that no one else can do. Thiel argues that the latter is more important for creating a monopoly and building a successful company. He also talks about something called the secret, and no, we're not talking about that book. <laughs> uh, he talks about the importance of creating a secret in your company or the company you work for, which is a unique way of doing something that can't easily be replicated by competitors. He argues that the best companies often have a secret that is hard to replicate, and that allows them to create a monopoly in their market. He at the end of the book, at the end of the chapter, pardon me, he encourages entrepreneurs to think about the unique way their company creates value, and again to focus on creating a monopoly in the market. He encourages entrepreneurs to be proactive in creating a secret, and to think about how to make their comp company defensible in the long term. Okay, let's get on to the next chapter. The next chapter is the ideology of competition. In this chapter, Thiel critiques that critiques the idea that competition is always good and necessary for progress and argues that in many cases competition is actually detrimental to innovation and progress this is basically adam smith being flipped right upside down if you ask me but he goes on to defend it uh, the author states starts by discussing the concept of perfect competition in which many companies compete on equal footing and no single company has a significant advantage he argues that this is an idealized concept that doesn't exist in reality and that in most markets, there are a few dominant companies that have a significant advantage. He goes on to discuss the problems with competition, ar competition arguing that it often leads to overproduction, low profits, and a lack of innovation. He also notes that in many cases, competition is a zero-sum game in which one company's gain is another company's loss. The author also mentions that in the tech industry, the most valuable companies are those that create something new and unique rather than simply competing in existing markets. He argues that in order to create something truly unique and valuable, a company must be able to create a monopoly and to avoid competition as much as possible. That's right. You want to create a monopoly. You want to avoid competition. You want to have a secret. It's quite, uh, you know, it's, it's a pretty interesting book for sure. Um, let's see what else we got here. He also states that competition that competition is always good and necessary for progress and argues that the many cases competition is actually detrimental to innovation and progress. Maybe I should re-say re that. He critiques the idea that competition is always good and necessary for progress. Sorry, I might be a little more clear there. And argues that in many cases competition is actually detrimental to innovation and progress. He encourages entrepreneurs to think about how to create a monopoly in their market and to focus on creating something new and unique rather than simply competing with existing companies, as we stated earlier. So there we go, a little repetition. Okay, let's get into chapter five. All right, this one is Last Mover Advantage. Yes, again, another unique title. Uh, in this chapter, he discusses the importance of being the last company in a market and how it relates to creating a monopoly and building a successful company. I'm going to repeat that, how to be the last mover in a market. This is pretty different than the standard first mover uh, advantage stuff you'll read in a lot of textbooks. He goes on to discuss the difference between first mover advantage and last mover advantage. First mover advantage refers to the idea that the company that enters a market first has a significant advantage over later entrants, whereas last mover advantage refers to the idea that the company that enters a market last after all the initial competition has been sorted out, has a significant advantage. He argues that last mover advantage is more important for creating a monopoly and building a successful company. Wow. He goes on to discuss the importance of creating a defensible position in a market and how it relates to last mover advantage. He argues that the best companies are those that have a unique and defensible position in the market and it allows them to create a monopoly. Again, we stay the same thing. Um, let's see what else he says here in this one. There he goes. Uh, he also, okay, here we go. He also talks about how to create a defensible position and he suggests it can be done through proprietary technology, network effects, economies of scale, and branding. He also notes that it's important to be aware of the potential for disruptive technologies to come along and change the game. Kind of like this chat GPT that just popped out a few days ago. So there we go. It's, it's, this is true stuff here. This is real talk. Um, let's get into the next one. In this chapter, he discusses the importance of being, the, again, the last company in a market, 
how it helps create a monopoly, and how it can build a successful company. Keep that in the back of your head because that's going to tie into the next chapter. And this one is, you are not a lottery ticket. <laughs> that's the name of the chapter, and it's a great chapter. Uh, in this one, he discusses the importance of having a plan and strategy for building a successful, successful company rather than relying on luck or chance. Ah, okay. He starts off by discussing the idea of a lottery ticket strategy, which refers to the idea that a startup can achieve success, success pardon me, simply by having a good idea and hoping to get lucky. He argues that this strategy is unlikely to work and that most successful startups have a clear plan and strategy for building their company. So this is getting back a little bit more towards the conventional business um, education as opposed to some of his earlier stuff, which was quite contrarian. He goes on to discuss the importance of having a clear mission and a vision for a company and how it relates to having a plan and strategy. He argues that the most successful companies have a clear mission and vision that guides their decision making and helps them stay focused on their goals. He also notes that having a plan and strategy also means to have a clear understanding of the market, the customers, and the competition. He argues that it's more important for entrepreneurs to have a deep understanding of their market and to be able to identify and capitalize on opportunities that others may miss. He goes on and talks about the importance of execution and how it's the most important element in creating a successful company and how having a good idea is not enough. It's just not, it's important to have a team and it's also how important it is to have a team that can turn the idea into a reality. This is standard stuff, but having an idea is again, not enough. Execution always matters more than idea and he goes on at great lengths to discuss that. Um, let's go into the next one. The next chapter is follow the money. In this chapter, Thiel exa he explains how startups can use funding to their advantage and how to raise capital effectively. He starts off by discussing the importance of understanding the different stages of startup funding and how each stage requires a different approach. He explains that early stage startups typically rely on friends and family, angel investors, and incubators to raise, seas to raid to raise seed capital, while later stage startups typically rely on venture capitalists and private equity firms to raise growth and capital. He notes that each stage of funding comes with different expectations and requirements and that it's important to understand these differences and tailor your approach accordingly. He talks about the importance of having a clear plan and strategy for how the funding will be used and how it aligns with the overall vision and mission of the company. He also discussed the importance to clearly communicate this plan to potential investors to increase the chances of securing funding. He also talks about being aware of the terms and conditions of the funding and how they may impact the company's decision making in the future. He also encourages entrepreneurs to be proactive in seeking out funding and to be open to different types of funding such as debt or equity. There you go, so raising capital. The chapter ends with Thiel encouraging entrepreneurs to have a clear plan and strategy for how funding will be used to have a strong and experienced team in place and to be aware of the terms and conditions of the funding and to be proactive in seeking out funding. He also stresses the importance of tailoring the approach to funding to the stage of the startup. So depending on where you are in your startup process, tailor your approach, change your sales pitch a little. And also you want to communicate the plan and strategy effectively to potential investors. Standard stuff, but makes perfect sense. In the eighth chapter, it's called Secrets. In this chapter, Thiel ex discusses the importance of having unique and proprietary advantage, also known as a secret, in order to create a monopoly and build a successful company. He alluded to this a little bit earlier on, and in this chapter, he goes into more depth. The author just starts by discussing the concept of secrets and how they relate to creating a monopoly. He argues that the most successful companies have a secret or a unique proprietary advantage and again, allows them to create a monopoly. I said that twice, but that's okay. It's late. Uh, Theo goes on to discuss the, import, the different types of secrets that a company can have, including technological secrets, business model secrets, and branding secrets. He notes that each type of, each type of secret has the potential to create a monopoly in its own way and that it's important for entrepreneurs to identify and capitalize on the secrets that are relevant to their business. He also emphasizes the importance of keeping secrets and how it's important to protect them from competitors by using patents, trademarks, and other legal means to keep them proprietary. He also notes that it's important to be aware of the potential for disruptive technologies to come along and change the game, like ChatGPT, for example. 
He talks about how secrets are discovered and how it's important to be open to new ideas and experiment with different approaches. He encourages entrepreneurs to be proactive in searching for secrets and be open to new and unconventional ideas. The chapter ends with him encouraging entrepreneurs to identify and capitalize on the secrets that are relevant to their business and to protect them from competitors and again, be open to new unconventional ideas in order to discover them. The ninth chapter and the final chapter in the book, this one is called Start Small and Monopolize. In this one, Thiel uh, discusses the importance of starting small and focusing on a niche market in order to create a monopoly and build a successful company. He starts by discussing the importance of starting small and focusing on the small market and how a niche market allows a company to gain a deep understanding of the market, the customers and the competition, which is, cru which is crucial for creating a monopoly. All right, fair enough. Uh, he also emphasized the importance of scaling up and expanding into other markets once a monopoly has been established within a niche market. Get your niche, get the monopoly in that niche, and then scale. He notes that once a monopoly has been established in a niche market, it's important to scale up and expand into other markets in order to create a larger and more valuable company. He talks about the importance of being aware of the potential for disruptive technologies to come along and change the game again, and how it's important, again, to be open to new ideas and experiment with different approaches. The chapter ends with him discussing, in, pardon me, encouraging entrepreneurs to start small and focus on the niche, and again, capitalize and identify niche markets that are relevant to your business to scale up and expand into other markets once a monopoly has been established with a niche market, and again, be open to new and unconventional ideas in order to discover them. That is the nutshell. That is the audio summary of the book. Please let me know your thoughts. If you like these types of things, hopefully you can read it in on your way to work. That's all I got for this one. I got a ton more videos coming up, ton more audiobooks coming up. Thanks for listening.